Going into the second year now, you'll find that the wave properties of light are an unavoidable part of geometrical optics. In this video, I'll start drawing some distinctions between the ray model and the wave model of light, and eventually you'll come to see how they're part of the same picture. Beginning with optical path length, which is a little different than a geometrical length, a wave in vacuum is incident on a piece of glass. In the higher index glass, the wavelength is now the vacuum wavelength, lambda, divided by the refractive index. Although the length of the glass is L, the wave sees a distance of n glass times L. The product of refractive index and length is called the optical path length. This is both a wave and a ray that is incident on the glass, and in both descriptions, refraction occurs. A ray only refracts because it has wave properties, so there's really no way to avoid a wave treatment of light. Most refractive indices in the visible range are between oh, about 1.3 and 1.8, and then they go a little bit higher in the infrared, but these numbers are in the visible. The wide range is shown for glass here from 1.46 up to 2.02 .02 because there are a lot of different glass materials and in fact optical design taps into an enormous database of commercially available glass materials in order to perfect the designs. Vitreous humor is up here because optics of the eye is a problem in optical instrument design. The eye is part of any instrument. PMMA is a non-polymer organic and olefin is also a polymer material and they're used in small aperture cameras such as cell phone cameras and webcams and are much cheaper to mass produce than glass lenses. There are two main categories of glass, crown and flint, where the crown glasses are the ones with the lower refractive indices and the flint glasses tend to have higher and the crown glasses tend to have a refractive index that's more stable with wavelength. And by stable I mean you change the wavelength, you change the refractive index. That's a property of light called dispersion. One common crown glass is BK7, with its number shown here. A common flint glass is SF2. The flint glass has a little bit of a higher refractive index, but what I really want to point out is how the refractive index of the flint glass changes more significantly as the wavelength changes. It may not seem significant, but this very small difference has a large effect on how various colors in light split when they refract. These wavelengths have spectroscopic significance and they have names too. They're called C light, D light, and F light, red, green, and blue light. All of the refractive indices above are given at D light. Total internal reflection is clearly a first year physics topic, but it has a lot of applications, one of which I'm about to talk about. If light is incident on an interface between two media of two different refractive indices and the angle in the second medium, theta sub t, t for transmitted, i for incident, is given by Snell's law and inverting Snell's law gives the actual angle and in the event that it's 90 degrees that argument of the arc sine should be set equal to 1 and solving for the angle of incidence theta sub i. And when the ratio of refractive indices n transmitted over n incident equals sine of the incident angle, there will be no light transmitted into the second medium because theta transmit theta sub t became 90 degrees. The angle where that happens is called the critical angle, sine of the critical angle being the ratio of the refractive indices. If mechanical waves propagating through a material arrive at another material with lower density, total internal reflection becomes a possibility. So refractive index is often referred to as optical density, an analogy to mechanical density. If a material has a higher refractive index, it's said to be more optically dense. An optical fiber is a long dielectric waveguide that accepts light from an external source and then contains it, passing it down a long distance. In this picture, the very tip of an optical fiber is receiving light at angle alpha. In this case, it's incident from air, so it will set the refractive index of the air to 1, but the refractive index of the fiber is just n sub f, and what I want to know is what does n sub f need to be such that all of the light that enters, regardless of alpha, does not escape the side of the optical fiber. A ray enters at alpha, proceeds through at an angle beta, and then it arrives at the edge of the fiber and it might exit at an angle delta. I want delta to be 90 degrees. So given the case of alpha being 90 degrees and delta being 90 degrees, what is the refractive index? Two refraction events occur, one at the input point, point 1, 
and one at the exit point, point 2. Applying Snell's law to each case at point 1, light is incident from an index of 1 at an angle of alpha equal 90 degrees, and it enters the fiber then at an angle beta. So that just equals 1. Now in the upper corner of the triangle, the angle is 90 degrees minus beta. So Snell's law at point 2 is the refractive index of the fiber times sine of 90 degrees minus beta. That has to equal the refractive index of air times sine of delta, which is 90 degrees. Those come out to 1 as well, because 1 times sine of 90 is 1. Then sub f sine of beta is 1, and n sub f sine of 90 minus beta is also 1. It can only be true that beta is 45 degrees. Put that 45 degrees back into 1 and solve for the refractive index of the fiber being the square root of 2. So as long as the refractive index of the fiber is the square root of 2, or 1.41, or larger, then light will remain in the fiber regardless of the angle alpha. Most optical fibers have additional material outside called the cladding that's been doped, giving it a slightly lower refractive index. Again, that light be incident, but instead of calling the external refractive index n sub air, I'm going to call it n sub 0 to be a little more general. Run through the exact same procedure again, setting up Snell's law at points 1 and point 2, and you find out that the maximum value for the angle alpha now is that expression in order to contain all of the light. That angle alpha max gives the numerical aperture of the fiber, and it's actually the sine of that angle, times the external refractive index. So the numerical aperture of a fiber, which describes the acceptance cone of light going into the fiber, is the square root of n sub f squared minus n sub c squared. And in this example, using these refractive indices, the numerical aperture comes out to 0 0.1. It's hard to get a numerical aperture close to 1, although for an unclad optical fiber, that's in principle what it is. Numerical aperture is commonly used in describing the optical properties of microscopes. In that case as well, you have an acceptance cone of light. And a lot of effort is made by designers to increase the numerical aperture of microscopes. You'll hear references to high numerical aperture microscopes, which are achieved by immersing in oils. There actually are cases where microscopes have exceeded a numerical aperture of 1. Fermat's principle of least time can be used to establish the validity of Snell's law. Imagine a beam of light coming in, and these two red lines are just the two edges of the beam. So between these two red lines, there's lots of light. The light arrives at an interface between two materials of refractive indices n sub i and n sub t. With n sub t, the larger of the two, the light is slower in the bottom media because the refractive index is larger. The speed of light in a medium is given by the speed of light in vacuum divided by the refractive index. And since the speed of light is lambda times frequency, the wavelength is the speed of light divided by the frequency of the light over the refractive index. The light arriving at the interface is also a wave, and this is where the wave nature and the ray nature are quite coupled. I'll indicate the wavelength as the spacing between these two red lines. Fermat's principle of least time says that the transit time of light from where it starts at the top of the screen to where it ends at the bottom of the screen will follow a path that minimizes the time for travel. So the refracted ray is going to head straight for that bottom location at an angle of theta sub t, the transmission angle. The wave crests, which are separated by a wavelength lambda sub i in the top medium, need to be continuous across the interface. So in the bottom medium, the waves are closer together call lambda sub t the wavelength and that results in the bottom medium. Four points have been identified. The distance from A to D is four wavelengths, and the distance from B to C is four wavelengths, but they're wavelengths in the different media, lambda sub i and lambda sub t. Considering a triangle on the top and a triangle on the bottom, you can write the sine of theta sub i as the distance from B to C divided by the distance from A to C, which then gives an expression for the distance from A to C is the distance from B to C over the sine of the angle of incidence. The sine of the transmission angle, likewise, is A to D divided by A to C, and so the distance from A to C can be written as this. Two expressions for the distance from A to C. The right-hand side of these two equations must be equal. 
So set them equal using four lambda as the lengths b to c and a to d, and using c over frequency times refractive index as an expression for lambda. You might pause the video for a minute and confirm for yourself that this equation on the bottom is in fact correct. Cancel what cancels, and you're left with the law of refraction, or Snell's law. For Mao's principle of least time gives us the law of refraction, it also gives the law of reflection from a differently structured argument. Light leaves point one, reflects off of a reflecting surface, and arrives at point two. On the way to the reflecting surface, it travels a distance z1, and on the way to point two, it travels a distance z2. Call the horizontal distance from point two to where the reflection occurred x, leaving d minus x as the remaining distance. Call the angles theta sub i and theta sub r for incident and reflected. The total distance traveled by the light from point one to point two is z1 plus z2. And using Pythagorean's theorem, rewrite z1 and z2 in terms of h, d, and x. Fermat's principle of least time says that the light will follow a path from one to two that minimizes time. And since the refractive index is the same everywhere, minimizing time and minimizing distance traveled by the light is the same thing, so z itself is minimized. Take its derivative relative to x, set it equal to zero, and solve for x equals d over two. If x equals d over two, then the point where the reflection occurs is exactly halfway between points one and points two. So theta incident equals theta reflected, and that's the law of reflection. The law of reflection describes specular reflection, where you have a ray coming in, hitting a perfectly smooth surface, and reflecting off at the angle it came in. Not all reflection is specular. That's one of two main types of reflection. A mirror produces specular reflection. Also diffuse reflection, which I'm looking at right now when I look down at the white tabletop I'm sitting at. Perfectly diffuse reflection is attempted in the design of the surfaces in movie screens, where light comes in at one angle, that of the projection beam, and then scatters out equally in all directions, something called Lambertian scattering. A real surface is neither perfectly specular nor perfectly diffuse. What really happens is there's a combination of each. Some light scatters out specularly, where the angle of reflection equals the angle of incidence, but other light scatters in all directions. The scattering is a result of the surface not being perfectly smooth. So instead of being a horizontal surface, it's actually a hilly surface. So at the microscopic level, the surface is always facing out at something other than the normal angle. The problem of diffuse scattering occupies significant space in the optical engineering field. A specialty called straight light analysis is concerned with how light reflects and how light scatters, and especially with how light scatters. Although scattering from an ideal surface is in this nice circular pattern so that it scatters equally in all directions, from a real surface, the scattering is not so regular and is determined empirically and then fit to model equations. It's very common to refer to rays in terms of their location relative to the optical axis, which is the axis that goes down the center of any optical system. If rays are close to the optical axis, they're called paraxial rays, and if they're farther away, something happens. The angle of incidence of a ray relative to a surface grows as the ray moves away from the optical axis. Rays that are close to the optical axis have a very small angle of incidence, and rays that are farther, well, they don't. And there's a consequence of that. The rays that are not paraxial, the ones that are far away, like this darker red ray on top, will hit the optical axis at a different point. You know, if rays come in parallel, they're supposed to strike the optical axis at the focal point. But non-paraxial rays, the ones that are farther away, hit it somewhere else, either in front of or behind the focal point. That's called spherical aberration, when rays that are not near the optical axis miss the focal point. It's either positive spherical aberration or negative spherical aberration, depending on whether that ray hits the optical axis in front of or behind the focal point. When a ray is paraxial, the angle is small. And when an angle is small, sine of theta equals theta in radians. So a fairly good approximation of Snell's law in the paraxial limit is n1 theta 1 is approximately n2 theta 2, where theta is in radians. What also happens for these rays that are far away from the optical axis is they strike the glass at a different horizontal coordinate than the paraxial rays. Surface sag, as it's called, is ignored in the paraxial approximation.
It's inconvenient to have to consider a different horizontal locations for where the rays strike the surface. There's a point called the principal point and an associated plane that cuts through it called the principal plane where all of the action can be assumed to happen. So for a thin lens, the principal plane is exactly where the thin lens is located. It cuts right down the middle of it. If a lens is thick, it's not so clear where to put that principal plane. It's not exactly down the center. It has a lot to do with the actual curvature of each surface. And the front surface and the back surface will produce principal planes in different places. So you have what's called the front principal plane P and the back principal plane or rear principal plane P prime. The principal planes can be found in a ray diagram by bringing in a parallel ray. It strikes the glass, refracts, and comes out to the back surface of the lens hitting the optical axis. If you look at the line that goes from the back surface of the lens to the focal point and extrapolate it back until it reaches the level of the incoming parallel ray, the place where those two lines meet is the principal plane associated with the back surface because it's like looking at the lens from behind. That's called P prime, the back principal plane. Now the distance between a lens and its focal point is called the focal length. But when the lens is thick, how do you measure that focal length? Do you measure it from the dead center of the thick lens? Do you measure it from a surface? No, you measure it from the principal plane. And that's why locating principal planes is an important thing to be able to do because you need to know where the focal point is. And when all you have is a focal length, you don't know how to locate that focal point unless you know where the principal plane is. You can repeat the exercise from the other side and locate the front principal plane. And there are hence two principal planes. It's the back principal plane though that is most frequently needed because you would like to know where light focuses coming out of an imaging system. There's a principal plane in reflecting systems too. A Cassegrain telescope is a reflecting telescope formed from two mirrors. The large concave mirror on the right is called the primary mirror. The small convex mirror on the left is called the secondary mirror. Light comes in from the left. It reaches the primary mirror, reflects, goes to the secondary mirror, reflects again, and focuses to a point. The eye can't make sense of light that's diverging. Your eye expects parallel rays, and that's what your eye knows what to do with, parallel light rays coming in. So the job of an eyepiece is to take diverging rays and collimate them, turn them into parallel rays. So if you want to use an eye to look at this Cassegrain telescope, you put a lens at the exit pupil, which is the topic covered in the third year, and you will make parallel light. Now to find the back principal plane, start at that focal point and extrapolate a line that runs along the outgoing ray. Where that line meets the incoming parallel ray is the back principal plane for the Cassegrain telescope. The focal length of a Cassegrain telescope is then the distance from the principal plane to the focal point. And that's the focal length of the two mirrors the focal length is much longer than the instrument. If you consider the distance between the secondary and primary mirrors, it's very small compared to the focal length. That's the telephoto condition, when the focal length is longer than the instrument itself. Maybe you don't want to look at this with an eye, but you want to use an imager. In that case, put an image sensor right at the focal point, because an image sensor expects light to be focused to a point unlike the eye which expects light to be forming parallel rays. So with the eyepiece instead, the outgoing light is parallel. The combination of the Cassegrain telescope and the eyepiece is a system that is afocal. Its focal point is undefined, it's been moved out to infinity. But with the image sensor, the focal point is actually used to form the image. So the lens serves the eye, hence it's called an eyepiece. The image sensor is like your retina, prepared to accept light focused to a point, in the case of the eye by the cornea and lens, in the case of the telescope by the mirrors. There's a very convenient equation for situations where there are two things, where there's two surfaces or two thin lenses. It gives the effective power, or rather the effective focal length of the system. It's useful for cases where there are two surfaces, such as a thick lens, or where there are actually two items, such as two lenses separated from each other. 
If it's being used for a thick lens, it's referred to as the lens maker's equation. These fees for surface refracting power are given by index after minus index before divided by the radius of curvature. It's called Goldstrand's equation if being used for two lenses, in which case phi1 and phi2 are 1 over the focal lengths. I'll give you an application in either case for a thick lens that has a radius of curvature of 80 and minus 120 millimeters respectively on the front and back with a given thickness and glass index. The focal length is given by this expression, but you do need to know the refracting powers of those two surfaces. Index after minus index before over radius of curvature is the expression. Calculate those values with the givens and then put them into the lens maker's equation and calculate effective focal length for that lens. And you get 82.68 millimeters. The 5 millimeter thickness of the glass has a small effect on the focal length. If that's ignored, you would erroneously arrive at 81.9 millimeters for the focal length. So the 5 millimeter thickness of this lens has about a 1% effect on the focal length, which, believe it or not, is significant when constructing an optical system. In the other situation where there are two thin lenses separated by a distance and with the given focal lengths, Goldstrand's equation can be used to find the focal length. Let's do it graphically first. The ray comes in, it arrives at the first lens, refracts, gets to the second lens, refracts again. When it arrives at the positive lens, the first one, it converges, but then it gets to the negative lens, which is a diverging lens. The effect isn't to cause the light to diverge, the effect is to cause the light to converge less. So it bends back outward a little bit. The effect of this second diverging lens is to shift the focal point to the right of where it would be with only the first lens present. Goldstrand's equation will give the focal length, but it won't tell you where the focal point is. You'll need to know where the principal plane is for that. So let's find it. Extrapolate the outgoing ray backward until it arrives at the incoming parallel ray, and that's the principal plane. That's where the focal length will be measured from, and it's calculated using Goldstrand's equation. Plug in the givens, you get 136 millimeters from the back principal plane. The graphical method works well to find the principal plane, but it can also be done computationally. There's an equation that's packaged specifically for a two-element system. If I have these two lenses, power of phi1 and phi2, positive or negative, you can calculate the distance from the back vertex to the back principal plane, which is a very useful thing to have because if you're actually working with lenses, you have to measure things with the ruler and what we measure from when you locate the focal point, but the back surface of the back lens. So let's find that distance from the back surface of the second lens to the principal plane. There's a well-used expression for it, delta prime we'll call it. Delta prime can be positive or negative, depending entirely on whether phi1 is positive or negative. As drawn here, phi1 is positive, it looks like a converging lens. But if the first lens were a diverging lens, phi1 would be a negative number. But that's how it looks like in the example I was working on. Let's continue with it and find the distance from the back vertex to the focal point. If f is known from Goldstrand's equation, and then this distance is known, you add them together because delta prime is a negative number in this example, and you want to get the length of that green arrow. Put in the givens, and you get 82 millimeters for the back focal distance, which is the distance from the last vertex in the lens system to the focal point. A beam expander, otherwise known as a Galilean telescope, is made from two lenses. The first one is negative or diverging, and the second one is positive or converging. One has a negative focal length and the other is a positive. The idea is that if collimated light enters from the left, collimated light will exit from the right, or the other way around. This is useful as a laser beam expander. So if you have a laser beam of a certain width and you want a wider or narrower laser beam, this combination of lenses can be used to alter the width of the laser beam. It also serves as a telescope. The beam diameter is expanded by the ratio of the focal lengths and the separation between these elements should be the sum of the two focal lengths, keeping in mind that F1 is negative and F2 is positive. Let's look at what Goldstrand's equation has to say about the focal length of the system. Effective focal length is now put in 1 over f for each of the powers. 
and we have the constraint that d equals f1 plus f2. So inspect this result for a second and you realize everything cancels. The power of this combination is zero, meaning the focal length of this combination is undefined or rather infinite. And if the focal length is at infinity, then the principal planes have been moved out to infinity as well. This is an example of an afocal optical system. Afocal means the focal points are at infinity. Parallel light in will result in parallel light out. Galilean telescopes have been used for a long time in opera glasses. This is a picture of an antique opera glass. And when you see surgeons with these little telescopes on their glasses, they're called surgical loops, and that's a Galilean telescope inside. With that optical device, the surgeon is able to view something that's perhaps 20 or 30 centimeters away as if looking through a magnifying glass. Now we're ready to move on to year three of geometrical optics, and I'll cover stops, pupils, and apertures, and then use that to introduce ray tracing, which is in contrast to what you see on the screen right now, which is a ray diagram.